Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, great to see you. And uh, wow, I recognize Dow. Glad you're here with us. Hello. Uh, before I speak tonight, uh, you're you're now seeing uh, my library, and um, pretty much most every day I hang out in here. You know, a lot of people hang out in music rooms and. I don't know other places. I'm either here or on the pickleball court in the backyard. <laughs> One of the two places. But I have two favorite people with me tonight. Uh, one is Eliza Allen. She is a recently returned missionary from Lyon, France. And I've asked her to say a couple of words. And all you men in Stanford, this will give you uh, another reason besides uh, Lynn's house in Hobble Creek why you want to come to Utah. <laughs> so uh, she's going to take my spot. And uh, her name is Eliza Allen. Hello. So sorry, I don't want to take up too much time. Like you said, the, we have some amazing speakers tonight. So um, just the one thing I thought I could share really quick was something that I remember from a devotional a few years ago that Elder Uchtdorf gave that I really loved for young adults. Um, and he talked about impressionist paintings, actually, and how, you know, where the dots make up an, a big masterpiece. And he, he told, a, he said a quote that was, you can't um, see how the dots connect looking forward, you can only see how the dots connect looking back. And that's something that I think about often during um, this time where we don't really know what's going to happen in the world. It's hard to see maybe when this will end or when things might change or even in our individual personal trials it's hard to see how things might work out but just really important to remember that that god has a masterpiece of our lives and he knows how it looks and he knows from the beginning to the end and so as we pray and trust in him then we can have faith that the dots will connect as we go forward in in christ so um i'm very excited to to hear from these wonderful people tonight i can uh, vouch for them as well. They're really people of God. And so I know that that God really is guiding us and that um, the Spirit is with us tonight. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay. Well, everyone, uh, I really like Eliza. And um, I hope to grow up to be just like her. You know, it's uh, between Eliza and Lynn's mom, you know. <laughs> I'm going to try and make this happen. But now another really great person in my life besides Eliza Allen is my husband, George Durant. And uh, I can say a lot of great things about George, but the best is he adores me. So with that, here's George. Welcome to Midnight Mass. <laughs> Susan asked me to talk about repentance. I had a I went into England on a mission. I picked up the language just like that. And I spoke at street meetings in England. And I had some experience and a new missionary came and he, we were going to speak at a street meeting. And he, he, I said, would you like a little advice on what you could say, Elder Blair? And he says, I don't need any advice from you, Elder Durant. My mother told me what to say. I said, all right. And he stood up and looked at the people and finally he spoke and he said, repent. And he paused and finally came back and stood by me. And I said, is that all you're going to say? He said, that's all my mother told me to say when I came on my mission, to tell the people to repent. Now, I think you've got to add something to it. And I'd like to tell a story that illustrates what you need to add when you're going to call people to repentance. I was taking my first art class at Brigham Young University. I didn't know you had to put your art pieces up and have the other students criticize them. I didn't want to put mine up, but I had no choice. So I put it up as far off to the side as I could so they wouldn't get to it during the critique. As they started critiquing the paintings, I thought I won't critique theirs. And if they're Christians, they won't critique, say anything negative about mine. And finally they got to mine. I didn't think they would, but they did. I didn't dare look up. My painting was up there and all eyes were upon my first painting. And I, waited and finally through the silence a girl spoke up and said i like the way he did the sky that gave me courage i looked up and looked at the sky and when i looked at the sky i said by george that is a nice sky then a boy spoke up and said you know he's got a nice sky but 
his foreground is all messed up. And I remember thinking, why don't you look at the sky? <laughs> and then I decided that was my motto from then on was, why don't you look at the sky? But you can't tell people to look at the sky until you've already proven to them by what you've said and done that you think they have a wonderful sky. If people think you think that they've got a wonderful sky, then you're in a place where you can tell them, but your foreground is all messed up. And if you want to tell them that, you have to first of all tell them that in a spirit of love. And I know it's easy to shout repentance, but it's in your personal relationships with people, not with great crowds of people, but just one. You just have to show that person, I, I think you have a wonderful sky. But you know, your foreground is messed up. Why don't you consider some, making some changes? In the name of Jesus Christ, you can change. That's what it's all about. And in this world that's tw torn apart by the virus and so on, the one sure thing we know is we all need to repent because Heavenly Father has told us all, you have a wonderful sky, but foregrounds a little bit messed up all of us have that i love you thanks for letting me speak hey, but why don't you teach him a, a song i'd like to teach you a song that i personally wrote you'll have to put on your thinking caps now as i tell you what the first verse is the first verse is oh my let's all try singing it together if you can memorize it oh my <laughs> oh my the second verse goes like this why don't you look at the sky? <laughs> now put those two together if you can. Oh my, why don't you look at the sky? Here we go. Oh my, why don't you look at the sky? <laughs> and when you do that, you get the feeling that as good as you are, and we still all need to shape up a little bit and make our foreground as beautiful as our sky. I love Susan, and I gave this talk because she told me, George, I want you to give a talk. So she <laughs> thinks it's good for my soul. And it is, because I feel good, because I get to talk to you. And I know what I said is true. I bear my testimony that Jesus Christ can help us to shape up our, our, our foreground. That's what he's for. Nobody's perfect, they tell me, but uh, we can all move closer and closer to that. It's good to see you, dear Lynn. I think you're one of the most marvelous folks I've ever known. And I'm glad that your handsome husband who sits by your side got the very best, because that's what he deserved. Susan, that's it for me. All right. Well, hi, everyone. OK, I'm back. You can tell why I like Eliza and George. Uh, both of these two make my days pretty terrific. So uh, with that, I've been asked by Lynn if I would speak about Nauvoo, and you're going to see me possibly off in a corner, but what you're really going to see are some questionable PowerPoints, but what I really wish is that we were all there, and I'm going, look at this, look at this, but okay. I thought uh, tonight I would talk about Nauvoo then and now. So uh, we first obviously talk about then, as we do Eliza looking back at the dots and how they connect, and then we come to now. So here goes. Uh, when Nauvoo was part of the Latter-day Saint experience, there were 26 states in the United States, and this was our flag. If I kept it on long enough, you would be able to count all of those 26 states. If you looked at a map of the United States, what you're seeing is uh, everything in blue and kind of a maroon color. That was the United States when, uh, when, when you're looking at the time period of Joseph Smith. When you look at the blue states, they were states that were called democratic states. And they're gonna vote for a democratic uh, president. And then where you get the more maroon colors, they were the Republican states at the time. So as we get the time period of Joseph Smith, when he's there in Illinois, and Nauvoo's in Illinois, Nauvoo was viewed as a swing state. 
because population wise and uh, the electoral ballot, uh, it's going to be more even than it appears on the map. Well, all right, how do we get to Nauvoo? And it goes like this. Latter-day Saints were asked to exit from the state of Missouri. That there was a governor, and no doubt we should all boo and hiss when we say his name, but it was Lilburn W. Box that had the audacity to issue an extermination order that will now uh, force the Latter-day Saints uh, to be driven from the state. Now, the place that they will be driven to, there was a barge town on the Mississippi, meaning that barges went back and forth between the state of Missouri and the state of Illinois, Illinois becoming a state in 1818. So where the saints headed to was a place called Quincy, Illinois. And uh, in Quincy, one of the people that will die there, and there's now a bench there thanks to Dow, but uh, one of them will be Brigham Young's father. But in Quincy, Illinois, Joseph Smith will hold a general conference. Uh, notice when it's held, it's held then the early part of May of 1839. Uh, general conference where you get April and October, uh, you know, didn't happen till later. But in Quincy, they held a conference in May and the decision was made that, uh, that the Latter-day Saints would move up river and accept the offer of a man that was called a land speculator. Today we give them the much more noble title, land developer, but back then they were called speculators. And Isaac Gallon has all kinds of land in a swamp town that used to be called uh, Venus after a uh, kind of goddess of love, right? Because if you call your town Venus, everybody knows that when you're going to go west, the man always goes west first, with Illinois being the western part of the United States. And if the man likes it, he will return back to where he came from and pick up his wife and sweetheart, and sometimes they're one and the same. And so, <laughs> Isaac Gallen is a land speculator. He's changed the name from Venus to Commerce, and uh, he's now giving the Latter-day Saints a chance to settle on his land for no money down. And uh, one of the contracts says 20 years uh, until the first payment. Now you realize Isaac Gallon is desperate to unload his, his land. None of us want to be that desperate, but perhaps in this COVID thing, we almost feel it. But nevertheless, he wants out and Joseph wants in. Joseph described as he now moves to the Isaac Gallon land, known as Commerce, and we know today as Nauvoo, uh, he described it as a swampland. It's a wilderness. And um, wow, you can't, there's smells from the swamp. Uh, swamps are tough, and the disease you're gonna get is obviously malaria. But as Joseph now goes on to this wilderness land, being the first Latter-day Saint to move to the Isaac Gallon land on May 10th of 1839, as he moves there, he makes a prophecy about this amazing land. He said that he was going to build up a city that would become like a light unto the world. You know, you think over in Israel, you can look up there at the night and you can see this, amazing city that's like a light unto the world. And for the prophet Joseph Smith, what you're seeing here, he goes, we can do this. Now, I like Joseph because he's not detoured. Uh, he, he doesn't give up easy, kind of like my friend Lynn, right? <laughs> Just give me another obstacle. I've, my name's all over that. And I, I really like Joseph that he can look at this and say, hey, I'm going to build up a city. So the first Latter-day Saints moving to town, May 10th, 1839. It's the prophet Joseph. His wife, Emma, is reported to stand five feet nine. Uh, he, he indicated she was large boned. I told George, you can call me a lot of things, but 
but don't, don't call me large bone. <laughs> now, okay, where they're going to move, they're gonna move into what today we call the Joseph Smith Homestead, but was one of the houses constructed when the place was called Venus. And the crazy thing, all the houses that were still standing from Venus, they're two stories. And uh, you say, why are they two stories? They are literally trying to get above the swamp. And they're trying to get above the smell of the swamp and the strange fever. And they think if they build a second story house, they can escape uh, with this strange fever. Now, you have to wonder about their IQ. I don't think any of them would have made it into Stanford. <laughs> you know, I, I think we can probably definitely say that. But nevertheless, Joseph moves into one of these homes, and he calls it the homestead. Now, as he moves in, he's got a plan for his people. And the big plan, you know, you think, is he sending out missionaries? You know, what, what's he doing? Are they talking about sacrament? And he goes, nope you got a shovel, he goes, drain the swamp. And so Navu is a bluff, you know, where you've got high and then you've got flat. He wants that flat land drained so that the land, you can farm it, you can build your houses, and you're not going to sink and be swept off in the Mississippi River. Now, it was literally a, you know, a Herculean type of feat to be able to drain that swamp land. Because if you're going to, you know, he's got a vision of this city on the hill. You can't just dream it away. You, you got to just work. And, uh, you know, for workers, there's always a place in the kingdom of heaven. <laughs> the one that sits on the side and wants to be the supervisor. I don't know. I don't know. But, but he, he wants workers. And uh, people that perhaps you'd say of missionary age, what are they asked to do? You get a shovel and you dig. Now, unfortunately, as the saints arrive there in commerce, uh, they, they're not immune to the illnesses, this malaria. So notice you take the word malaria. It is mal air, bad air. And uh, so the saints were doing the same things that people had done in Venus, trying to put up two-story houses with the idea of live on the second floor, live on the second floor. But... Um, People become very, very ill, and uh, they can't see what's causing the illness. And uh, some of the saints will write in their journals that they wish they were still back living in Missouri, that they can recognize the sheen of the sword and the musket, and you know you can see your enemy, but this unseen enemy in commerce they can't. And so. Um, if you're looking for where do you seem, you know, in all of church history, you know, in the lifetime of Joseph Smith, where do you get the most priesthood blessings? And I go, oh, Nauvoo. <laughs> for sure it's Nauvoo. Uh, you know, they're just going from person to person, blessing people. And uh, there was so much illness that uh, Joseph only lives in that, remember the house you saw, the homestead house? He only lives there two weeks and the rest of the summer, he lives in a tent on his front yard because his house has been turned into a makeshift hospital. And so, uh, well, they've got to have the spirit, they need people well. Now, there was so much death and dying from this, uh, uh, from the malaria and the strange fever. I mean, they called it all kinds of things that Joseph said, um, we're gonna hold funerals twice a week. We're gonna hold them on Monday and Thursday. Now, Thursday is a traditional day when Moses climbed up to Mount Sinai to commune with God. Monday is a traditional day, it comes down with the big 10 commandments. So, you know, think about your own word. You get a wedding invitation and I go, what do you think? Should we go, you know, definitely send a gift, right? And, but, you know, you have a funeral of somebody that you've known. Well, the whole world stops. I mean, we're all part of it. And so you couldn't always count that Joseph Smith would be able to speak on, say, a Sunday, as you've got these thousands of people coming into commerce. But you could always guarantee he's going to speak at the funerals. 
And so you would save your dead. Now, when you go to Nauvoo, <laughs> uh, be sure <laughs> and go to a uh, gravesite. Because uh, when you go to the gravesite and you take the messages from Joseph's sermons, literally those sermons become what we today know as temple work. So families can be together forever. Uh, you know, parents can be sealed to their children forever. You know, you can be endowed. You can live with your father in heaven. This, this family thing, it's all in the cemeteries. So although the houses are cute and all that, don't forget the cemeteries. All right. Well, amidst it all, uh, Joseph now becomes the architect of Nauvoo. And uh, what you see here is basically what you see the same kind of things uh, years later with Brigham Young in Utah. That Joseph, it's like he miters everything out. <laughs> and you go, Joseph, <laughs> this commerce, soon to be known as Nauvoo, is on a peninsula that juts out in the Mississippi River. But even where you get places close to out on the edge of the peninsula, everything he tries to make square. And where you have in, say, Salt Lake, Provo, Lehigh, American Fork, I should mention, up for George's hometown. Okay, uh, blocks were, were like um, 10 acres. But in Nauvoo, blocks are four acres. So where the Nauvoo Temple is, it's four acres. And if you had ancestors back there, they would have no more than four acres in town. Okay, but notice the whole church back then, uh, a man could be a lot of things. He could be a blacksmith, he could be a doctor, a dentist or whatever, but his bread and butter was he was a farmer. So you can't take these thousands of saints and put them all in a city and expect to have them support themselves. That on the side, it's like, you know, a lot of you have a second job. Your first job pays the bills. The second job is for extras, right? So most people in town, unless they had a really successful trade, had a house in Nauvoo and a farm on the outskirts of Nauvoo or somewhere else. So what you see, this was Joseph Smith's house, the White House, and they knew, used to name their houses back then. We've never done that. Perhaps we should do this, George, but he called his house his mansion house. I don't think we could call this a mansion house. We, we, we really, we'd have to really give some thought. But you can see then, uh, Joseph has a house in town and a farmhouse on the edge of town. Hiram Smith had a house in town. And what you're seeing here, the red brick part, is his farmhouse on the outskirts of town. So, <laughs> How it was is that if you were in Nauvoo, you had enough acreage in Nauvoo, you could build your house, your shop onto it, whether it's a bakery, a blacksmith, a whatever it is, and then you would have your garden. And then your kind of bread and butter, take it to the bank, is going to be your produce on your farm. So when you think of Nauvoo, some people just say, oh, Joseph Smith founded Nauvoo. And I'm like, hold it, for sure he did. But Nauvoo is like going to the city. When I was a kid growing up in California, if I wanted to go to the city, boy, I'm heading towards LA, the garment district. I'm really going to shop. I'm going to get China. Okay. So Nauvoo, for some of you that grew up in Utah, you'd say, you want to go to Salt Lake. Now, that, that's where you're going to shop. But then Nauvoo, in Joseph's mind, was the hub of a wagon wheel. In other words, Nauvoo is the center. Uh, that's where you're going to, you know, you have your church conferences, general conferences. That's where you're going to have your wards. And then out here on the spokes, those are your branches, <laughs> right? Uh, tied to a ward. And uh, so, okay, with that in mind, here goes. You'd say, well, wait, okay. So where you see this wheel going out here, Joseph founded uh, 23 communities on the Illinois side of the Mississippi River and 15 on the Iowa side. So he is a community builder 
And obviously, Brigham Young will continue that on a much larger scale. So let's say you're coming to Nauvoo. They had, in the town of Nauvoo, you had business districts. Uh, much like you'd say in towns where you're at, you have the strip mall or maybe you actually have a mall. But one business district, and it still functions today, is on Mulholland Street, named for Joseph Smith's secretary, James Mulholland, who actually wrote down um, for Joseph the, um, one of the accounts of the first vision. But when you look at this town, you can see um, it wasn't just taken last week. I think there would be less cars. <laughs> but, but Nauvoo is pretty depressed when you look at it today. But back then, Mulholland Street, oh, they had the Mammoth Hotel that had 50 rooms. Uh, you know, you just got all of this going on. The other business district in town was Main Street. Now, Main Street is where the church has restored most of the little buildings that you see in town. Let's say that you say to yourself, I want a molasses cookie at the Scoville Bakery. The Scoville Bakery is the most visited site in Nauvoo because of these cookies. The molasses cookies, they're not necessarily good, but you know, I've always thought, I wonder if all those kids that line up know that they were made in December and they're now there in July. <laughs> But, uh, okay, so Main Street was another, and then Water Street. Uh, Joseph Smith, his properties and his store, called the Red Brick Store, was on Water Street. Uh, this store is not original, the building here, but was built in 1980 as a sesquicentennial remembrance by uh, the reorganized Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, now known as the Church of Christ. But this store is significant. On the bottom level down here, that's, that's where you'd shop. And you know, you wanna buy shoes, dishes, okay. But the top story up here, that's sacred place or sacred space. That's where Relief Society is organized, first endowment given, for sealing of couples, Book of Abraham, that's all up there. And also on Water Street was the printing of the Times and Seasons. So when you, I, I hope all of you have seen Nauvoo. I, I think there's salvation without seeing Nauvoo, but, but don't chance it. So, uh, okay. When you think Nauvoo, you look there and you go, oh, it's so quaint. And what I want to, to show you tonight is Nauvoo is huge and it was industrious, they were going for it. There were 11 hotels when the prophet Joseph Smith was alive in Nauvoo. There were 11 mills down at the river. Uh, wait a minute, there were four stone quarries. Uh, there were 12 dentists in town. Do you know, today there is not one dentist that has a practice in Nauvoo. There were 12 midwives in Nauvoo. There is not one today. There were 12 doctors in Nauvoo. Now, mind you, they weren't all um, well-trained, like Willard Richards was a um, Thompsonian doctor. He attended school about six weeks. The medical school never pronounced him a doctor, but Willard Richards pronounced himself a doctor. And uh, you'll, you'll appreciate this. At one point, <laughs> there was a man in town that needed his leg cut off. And Willard Richards cut off his leg, and he charged the man $50.50. And uh, the man said, hey, just round it off at 50 bucks. And Willard said, no, no, your bill is $50.50. And the man goes, why? And he says, well, I charged you uh, 50 cents because I cut off your leg and 50 bucks because I knew how to do it. <laughs> so there you are. Okay, there were 12 drugstores in town. Uh, this is the look at the old uh, Joseph Smith uh, red brick store. There were 38 dry goods and grocery stores besides Joseph's. Got it? So what you're looking at, Nauvoo, is a business area. It's, uh, you know, it's industry. It's making it happen. All those little communities he founds on the outside of Nauvoo. Uh, one community, Yale Rome, had four stores. 
but no more. And that had the more stores than any, any other. So for all of you shoppers, and uh, I'd like to be, I just don't, don't have a place to wear any clothes anymore. <laughs> I, you know, yeah, you can't just buy something new and not show it off. So, I mean, so there, there were a lot of shopping going on then. There were nine steamboats that weekly would stop into Nauvoo. There were 24 tailors, like seamstresses. One man, John Bills, he, he just specialized in making Nauvoo Legion uniforms. Uh, okay. So you'd say, how's Nauvoo? And I go, oh my gosh, it is moving forward. Everything's going forward. And then disaster hits. June 27th, 1844. Joseph Smith is killed and you're seeing Hiram, uh, you're seeing Carthage jail, uh, falling out the second story window. And uh, his last words are, oh Lord, my God. And so then you look and you'd say, okay, what happens to Nauvoo? Since Nauvoo is our topic. Brigham Young will officially change the name of Nauvoo to City of Joseph. So notice all the names we're talking about. We had an Indian name to begin with, and then you have the uh, same land. It's called Venus, Commerce, Nauvoo, and by 1845, it's called City of Joseph. And uh, Brigham does something so smart. Brigham Young stood about five feet 10, had red hair and freckles, and the temperament that goes with that kind of look. You would not want to cross that guy. So uh, <clears throat> Brigham Young then said to the people, we're calling this city of Joseph, and I want you to build your memory or testimony of the prophet Joseph Smith. Now, um, you know, I, we, we like our house, okay? We wouldn't call it Blacks or Durant Mansion, right? But um, if you said to me, Susan, I, I want you to build your memory, your testimony of Joseph Smith. I mean, I'd have to buy out the block. I mean, <laughs> just, you know, I'd have to, yeah, there's Hertz Castle. And then they'd say, well, here, here's going to be the black memory. Now, um, as they did these, uh, as they did their homes, I'm going to feature Wilford Woodruff. Wilford Woodruff counted every single brick that went into his home. And I'm convinced he would have majored in math. The guy, the guy really, <laughs> he, he, he liked the count. And he wanted to make sure he had the biggest memory of Joseph Smith in Nauvoo. But to be politically correct, he could not, um, you know, he couldn't really have it a whole bunch bigger than Brigham Young's or John Taylor's or, you know, okay. So, so what he did was he made each wall inside the house eight bricks thick so that he would know that his house was the biggest memory of Joseph. So um, at one point, okay, I'm gonna feature this house a little bit. One point when Wilford is leaving Nauvoo, he leaves his front door wide open. He's bringing down a table. The table kind of mars the floor upstairs. And he says to his wife in the wagon, we can't go yet, what are you talking about? He then says, I gotta go up and fix it. So he fixes the floor, then he comes down again, he leaves the front door wide open, and he heads down to the Mississippi to cross and begin the amazing Mormon trek. But as he does so, his wife goes, well, why would you do that? And you're leaving the door wide open. He says, someday somebody may know that I lived in that house. And he said, it's my memory of Joseph and I have to leave it perfect. Uh, Wilford Woodruff, a diarist, uh, he goes out to the farmland before he leaves and he sees a very famous farm owned by a man named John Bimbo. His farm is much more, much more uh, important in England and known. But as Wilford walks uh, through his farm, he says to Brother Bimbo, he goes, uh, you know, as I walk through your farm, he goes, I, I don't even think that the Garden of Eden could be as beautiful as I now see your farm. And Brother Bembo says, oh, thank you, Wilfred. He said, I've just dedicated my farm to my memory of the prophet Joseph. So whether you're talking house, farm, shop, dedicated to the memory of Joseph in a place called the city of Joseph. And then Brigham Young, <laughs> like people say this features, um, 
the home of Heber C. Kimball. He only lived in the home 40 days and you go, oh my gosh, he went through all that work and he, only, he, he hadn't planned to live in the home. The home was his memory of the prophet Joseph. Okay, Brigham Young now says, flee Babylon by land or by sea. And um, we, we sing that song now, you know, um, ha, well, the men mostly <laughs> sing it. I really like it too, but uh, okay. Oh, Babylon, oh, Babylon, we bid thee farewell. We're going to the mountains of Ephraim to dwell. And uh, with that, you get the Latter-day Saints now abandon Nauvoo, their memory of Joseph, and they head west. And uh, here's showing, I think it's Glenn Hopkinson. Okay, uh, just incredible as they now all head and uh, the Mississippi freezes over for part of them in February and they now head towards Iowa as they flee Babylon, meaning, meaning the United States of America. And as they flee, they've left their temple now on the hill. Where they're going is they're heading to the Rocky Mountains. Now, uh, okay, it used to be for Brigham Young when the saints arrived in the valley and uh, especially during times of famine, he started holding uh, what were called fast and testimony meetings. And uh, the people would come and they would actually make the food they would have eaten if they were not fasting. And they put it in the bishop's wagon. The bishop would give the opening testimony then he'd come out, he'd leave the meeting, and he'd come out and he'd get in his wagon, he'd visit homes in his ward, and he would drop off food for anybody that uh, was in need. But during the bishop's absence, the only people allowed to bear their testimonies were those that had known Joseph. And you'd say, well, you know, I'm a convert. I just came from Denmark. And you'd say, hey, sit down, you'll have your chance. But those we know whose testimonies are true they had known Joseph. Now I've had an occasion in my ward to say to one woman, you've never known Joseph, sit down, sit down. <laughs> okay, but, okay. So of all the people that bear their testimonies, year after year and pretty soon, uh, they started, you know, there's about a hundred left as you get kind of the turn of the century. You get into the 20th century. And uh, this woman, is viewed as the last leaf on the tree, uh, dying in the 1940s, that uh, she lives long. I mean, she, she survives the, you know, the Civil War and all the, you know, war, you know, and uh, her name is Mary Gardner. And uh, she was called the last leaf on the tree. Like, you know, I know where you live, you only have morning and afternoon on weather. But where we live, you have this uh, snow. And we used to have a tree out our kitchen window, and we used to try and guess what, which, which leaf would be the last leaf on the tree. And this woman you now see, who lives to be, I think she gets up to 107. She is the last woman that had lived in Nauvoo that claimed that uh, as a child, she had known that he was the prophet. Okay, time passed. And Nauvoo is forgotten. People called Nauvoo the blight <laughs> because uh, you realize where are the people that were digging the ditches and building the houses? Well, they've all gone. And, uh, you know, like even our house, if we don't take care of it and do something, hey, it's all going to just tumble down. And Nauvoo becomes Nauvoo the blight. And then we turn to Joseph F. Smith, the prophet of God and a man named Lauren Farr. They came up with this amazing idea. Well, wh why don't we take these last leaves of the tree <laughs> at church expense, we're gonna take them back to Nauvoo. And by this time, you've got stenographers are falling behind, you know, writing down what all these old duffers have to say about Joseph. You know, what, what were his eyes? You know, was he portly, was he thin? And, uh, you know, okay, they're, they're taking notes. And so they think they'll, they'll go back to Nauvoo and, uh, when they get back there, they recognize their house, other things. Well, these people get back to Nauvoo, they, uh, <laughs> they, they can't even find where they lived. Um, they can't even find where the temple had stood. 
because the temple walls had come tumbling down and remember that molehill in one of the business districts it had expanded another block and i don't know you, you know how sometimes you plan a family vacation and the planning's better than the vacation <laughs> well that's exactly what happened here's all these old guys they're looking around and somebody from Nauvoo, a woman came down and sees all these people down on the flats and she approaches this lauren Farr, and he has a lot to do with Farr's ice cream all you guys like that and and so uh, she comes up to him and says uh, what are you doing here and he goes you know we we all used to live here and uh she said won't you come back she said Nauvoo was Nauvoo beautiful when when you were here and Lauren Farr claimed that he received a revelation that we would go back. And he totally changed the demeanor of what was going on in this little conference. And he gets back and he tells Joseph F. Smith, and he goes, I received a revelation, we're gonna go back. And uh, Joseph F. Smith says, uh, we'd never fit anymore on that small footprint of Nauvoo. He goes, don't you know that the church is up in Carson, Canada, and and that we're down in the colonies, you know, colonial wars were, you know, out, we're all there, Dublin, we're down in Mexico, and we could never fit in Nauvoo. Well, Lauren Farr, till his dying breath, claimed, I received a revelation, we will go back. We next turn to the guy in the middle named Brian S. Hinckley. Brian S. Hinckley, obviously, he's got a very famous uh, son named Gordon B. Hinckley. But Brian S. Hinckley, he was a school teacher by trade. He chose the better part, right? And uh, so he's called to be a mission president out in Chicago. And as part of his mission presidency thing, he has the area of, of Nauvoo. And uh, he comes to Nauvoo. He can't figure out where the temple was. He goes to Carthage. He's smart. And he comes back and he figures out, hey, it was on this one block where they now have uh, I carry in meeting hall, they have a shoe, shoe factory, they have a match factory, they have apartment buildings. And so Brian S. Hinckley doesn't have any money, but he's pretty smart. He's got a rich friend and his rich friend is named Wilford Wood. And he says to Wilford Wood, I want you to come uh, meet me in Nauvoo and I've got a block I want you to buy. And so here comes Wilford Wood. He made all his money. He was a furrier by trade when, um, women wore uh, mink coats. And uh, those were the good old days. I think today, you know, they'll all be spray painted, but okay. So Wilfred Wood comes back and he purchases most, well, he buys the mortgages and purchases what he can. And it's literally pays less than a thousand bucks. Certainly less than you'd ever pay for tuition at Stanford. But uh, he comes and he buys the temple lot. And so, when Brian S. Hinckley is through with his mission, Brian S. Hinckley and Wilfred Woodruff go to see now the president of the church, Heber J. Grant. And they say to Heber J. Grant, we got the lot for the Nauvoo Temple. And Heber J. Grant says, great, I'll take it. And they said, rebuild the temple. He takes these two men, has them look out at the Salt Lake Temple, and he goes, we, we don't build temples that size anymore. You know, have you not seen? the Salt Lake Temple. It would never fit on the footprint, that four acre lot in Nauvoo. Well, okay. We then turn to another man. Now, notice what I'm doing. There, it takes a lot of great people with vision and ideas that are willing to work. I, I guess that's my main message tonight. If you got a vision, an idea, and you're willing to work, you just be amazed what the Lord can do, do with, with you. Well, okay. So there was a man in Salt Lake. He was a doctor. He was incredibly rich. He's a heart surgeon, and his name was J. Leroy Kimball. And J. Leroy Kimball, he, he liked his art. I mean, he liked working on the heart, and he was trained in London. I mean, he just has these amazing degrees. But what he likes to do is he likes to read his uh, great-grandfather's journals. And so he reads a great, uh, about his great-grandfather, Heber C. Kimball. And he reads that Heber built this magnificent brick home in Nauvoo in memory of the prophet Joseph Smith. He just 
put his testimony literally in bricks. And J. Leroy Kimball decides, I want to see that. And so he works his way out to Nauvoo. And what he finds is, well, there's a wall. <laughs> there's vines. There's bushes. It's just, I mean, it's just crumbling apart. And this is the 1950s. And J. Leroy goes, he goes, I'm embarrassed. My great grandfather would be embarrassed. And he goes, I'm going to rebuild this. Now, none of us would have liked to work for Jay Leroy. He was the ultimate armchair, armchair general supervisor construction guy. I mean, he wanted the mortar between the bricks even. He's going around tape measure, he's measuring stuff, but he builds it. As uh, he puts this Heber C. Kimball house back together, the first uh, summer, 11,000 people knock on his door I want to know what you're doing. Well, okay, Jay Leroy has an idea. And uh, he knows he can't pull it off himself. So uh, he invites his much more famous cousin, Spencer W. Kimball. And he says, oh, I'd like to invite you to, you know, I guess your grandfather's place. It's all back intact. And I'd like you to bring your family out for a week in July. And so Spencer W. Kimball goes out there and he no sooner gets inside when people are knocking on the door and they go, oh, you could have a blessing, you know. Okay, finally, J. Leroy knocks on the door and uh, Spencer says, uh, where have you taken me? And J. Leroy goes, how do you like this nowhere place named Nauvoo? And then J. Leroy goes, I've got an idea. And, uh, you know, you get two great men. They now talk through the night and they go, well, what if we were to restore Nauvoo? And uh, <laughs> Jay Leroy says, well, the house in best condition is Wilford Woodruff. Well, for sure, the guy has slammed it through with bricks and all the walls. And he goes, well, we should restore that. And if we restore that, I mean, politically correct, we've got to do Brigham's house and John Taylor's. And, oh, you get these, they're up through the night. And then the question was, well, what about the Nauvoo Temple? Spencer goes, we've got the property. But the conclusion was, no, we, we don't build temples that small. But you know what we could do? We could do a six-story tower. We'll put an elevator in it. We'll have a widow's perch around the outside. People will get up to the top and they'll ooh and ah, and they'll say, oh, that's amazing. The temple is now taller than the water tower. Well, okay. By um, the wee hours of the morning, Jay Leroy says, are we going to do this? And Spencer says, we are going to do it. We are going to restore Nauvoo as our memory of the prophet Joseph. And uh, Jay Leroy goes, well, how are we going to do this? And uh, President Kimball goes, well, I've got a friend named Jay Willard Mary. And suddenly, boom, <laughs> big money rolls into Nauvoo. He goes, I've got another friend, uh, Kennedy, the Kennedy Center at BYU Outreach. I've got him and we're gonna bring in T. Edgar Lyons as a story and he's gonna find all these things. And Nauvoo Restoration Incorporated is born. And before they're through, they buy hundreds and hundreds and pretty soon thousands of acres in Nauvoo. Now, What's so interesting to me is uh, as these houses have been restored, they will be dedicated. And um, you know, you'd say, who's the typical person that goes out and dedicates them? And um, you know, it's gotta be an apostle, right? And so, you know, who's available this weekend? And your consistent person is Gordon B. Hinckley. And your consistent date of the dedication restoration June 27, 1844. It's martyrdom. So when I think Nauvoo, I think Joseph, memory of Joseph, and I think martyrdom. So whether you're talking Jonathan Browning gunsmith shop, Wilford Woodruff's house, no question, Jonathan Browning's gunsmith shop in the dedicatory prayer, uh, they talk about guns, how you make guns, slider guns, you know, repeating rifles, a uh, child buried in the, the yard. But before the prayer ends, the Jonathan Browning gun shop is dedicated to the memory of who? The prophet Joseph Smith. What is your largest landmass in the entire United States? 
dedicated to the memory of any one man. You know, is it Atlanta where you get Habitat for Humanities, Jimmy Carter, uh, Whittier, Richard Nixon? I mean, you know, blah, blah, blah. and I go, no, no, no. It is Nauvoo, Illinois, memory of the Prophet Joseph. So whether you're talking about uh, the Wainwright, the Blacksmith Shop, the Webb Brothers, <laughs> no question they talk about in the dedicatory prayer, wagons going west, but when it's all said and done, dedicated to the memory of the Prophet Joseph. Okay, so um, I've served now one, two, I've served four missions now to Nauvoo in different capacities. But my first was in 1995. And um, I was in the Lands and Records office. That makes sense. I love books. She looked behind me and go, yes, that's crazy. You should have, you know, what should be behind you, George? I could approve. Okay. But uh, my husband was called to the Nauvoo Temple site. And we were programmed to say when people said, hey, are they going to rebuild the Nauvoo Temple? We were supposed to start talking about the Washington, D.C. Temple and talk about an accident waiting to happen. I mean, it just looms up by the freeway. And, uh, huh. but then we would hear people in their testimonies in our war that would stand up and say that they weren't feeling well. A general authority had come through a prophet. They'd asked for a blessing. They'd gotten a blessing. And they were told they would live to see the Nauvoo Temple rebuilt. So it was like I was saying one thing, but then I was hearing from great friends something else. Well, we turn our attention now to an incredible man, Gordon B. Hinckley. I really like this guy. He and I stood about the same height. And uh, anyway, I just really liked him. As he grew up in the home of Bryant S. Hinckley, over their mantle in the front room in Salt Lake was the picture you see here, which you now see over the recommend desk of the Nauvoo Temple. And, uh, okay, so general conference, uh, what, it's uh, April, and it's 19, uh, I'm going to say 98. I'm no dummy, I'm sitting home, I know my name is not being read off, and uh, I'm, I'm kicking it back in sweats, and it's at the end of conference, and suddenly um, President Hinckley is a prophet, and he's thanking everybody for coming, and and uh, he's, telling, he's telling us, George, that even he's going to live better. You know, this repentance, I like your theme tonight. He says, hey, even he's going to live better. But then he goes, uh, I have an announcement to make. And then he starts coughing. And I'm going, where's the person that's going to get him some water? I mean, if there's anybody's announcement, I want to hear, I want to hear his. And uh, suddenly his announcement goes, I would like to announce we are going to rebuild the Nauvoo Temple. Oh my gosh, I had big tears, big tears. I could not believe that I had actually lived long enough to be able to see all these early saints I'd studied to say, oh, they just, they hate to leave their homes, but to leave the temple and that it would be, it would be rebuilt. There's no question the dedicatory prayer, you know, thanking the Lord for Jesus Christ, but dedicated to what, in addition to the, Jesus Christ to the memory of the prophet Joseph. Now, um, it was amazing when they rebuilt the temple. Um, they had 331,000 uh, 331, people toured it before it was dedicated. Uh, getting a dedication ticket to be able to get in there and the temple is going to be dedicated, you know, June 27th, you know, but 2002. And, uh, Oh my gosh, to, to get a ticket, it was like getting a ticket to a, a Super Bowl. Remember those good old days, right? I mean, it was just, oh, they were so hard to come by. And I got a call asking if I would take uh, general authority wives and then uh, turn them around Nauvoo and whatever. And, and for that, I would get a ticket inside on June 27th. Boy, I was saying, hey, even if I'm sitting on the ox and horns, I go, I'm in. Well, uh, the impact was amazing. Uh, President Hinckley dedicated the temple, um, the tabernacle choir, the men sang praise to the man. Praise to the man was a funeral eulogy 
given by W.W. Phelps uh, for the funeral of the Prophet Joseph, saying praise oil is just an occasion never to be forgotten. Well, okay, how is Nauvoo today? We know from section uh, 124 in the Doctrine and Covenants, it is a corner stake. You can't have a corner stake crumbling, right? And so lots of, lots of great leaders have made great promises for Nauvoo. <laughs> Will that happen in my lifetime? I haven't seen it yet. So here's what the future of population. Uh, you can see when the saints were there, thousands, right? Saints go, we come out, how was it in 2010? In 2010, the whole, you know, Hancock County, you know, that Nauvoo is a part, there was only one little city that gained in population and, and it was Elveston that went from 150 to 151. And you're like, what? Nauvoo is now about 800 people in town. Uh, the joke in town is if you wanna make a large fortune, come to Nauvoo with a small one. So, oh, wait, 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 hold on. I, wait, let me say it, just the opposite. If you wanna make a small fortune, come, come with a large one. I can say it, right? That's when you know I'm tired. Okay, so uh, George and I have a house in Nauvoo. Uh, you'd say, well, why would you do that? Especially since we haven't been out there for what, 10 months and kind of confined here in Utah. And I go, huh, I ever told you about the prophet Joseph Smith? There is a spirit in Nauvoo, uh, in town. You know, a lot of the missionary bands, other places, you know, when you visit something, they'll say, well, do you feel the spirit of the Lord? And, and you go, oh, yeah, yeah. But in Nauvoo, they always say, do you feel the spirit of Joseph? There's something about it. And uh, it's uh, the people that, that walk there. They were so important. Uh, it's the revelations received there. It's the, the temple that binds us to our families forever and ever. I mean, how great is that? And uh, well, it's the prophet Joseph. So um, everyone, I hope you've enjoyed uh, tonight. I know you enjoyed seeing Eliza and uh, hearing her wonderful thoughts about connecting dots. We can connect them in the past and I tried to do that today, but, uh, but the future is bright. And it's especially bright for those that keep their covenants and keep the commandments of God. You heard from George a new song. Oh my, <laughs> why don't you look at the sky, right? And uh, the sky in Nauvoo, oh, it's gorgeous. Uh, the birds, the eagles, the geese, uh, the Mississippi River at night, oh, just incredible. So, uh, but it's more than that. It's the lives of those that went before, their sacrifice, their faith, their love of the prophet Joseph, their willingness to follow Brigham Young and give it all up and leave a monument. Well, I, I'd like to thank Lynn and Dell for uh, giving George and I and Eliza this chance. I mean, here we, uh, we sit feeling like, wow, we have talents, but um, can we leave the home? And uh, it's an odd time. I pray that the Lord will bless all of you during this time and that uh, your prayers will be answered and that the choicest blessings of heaven will be yours now and forever. And uh, if we don't get to see you again until the next life, George says uh, the surprising uh, the most surprising thing you'll see in the celestial kingdom will be the surprise look on other people's faces. And so uh, I actually won't be surprised to see you because look how you've chosen to spend your evening. I say this humbly in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 For the 200 plus of us who've been listening to all three of you, we have just have heartfuls of thanks and motivated by the spirit. I hope everyone was able to feel the testimonies of each of the three of you. I certainly did. I'm so grateful. 
And next week we'll continue on with 1843. I've asked Jesse to give us our closing prayer and then I'll be happy to stay on for a few questions and let Susan and George go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Our Father in heaven, we're indeed grateful for this evening which we've been edified and uh, by the words of George, Eliza, and Susan. Help us to uh, take what we've learned this evening and be able to feel that, uh, that we felt the spirit and, and the spirit of Joseph as well, that we may be able to remember this and uh, maybe bring us uh, comfort and, and peace in times of uh, turmoil. We love thee so very much, and for these sins we give thee thanks for it. And with thy son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. And Jesse is the one who played ping pong with... Yeah. <laughs> In case you didn't know who I asked to give the prayer, it's your ping pong matcher. Yeah, yeah. See you next time. Yeah, yes. yeah. Thanks, Lynn. Love you. Good night. The next time we do another institute trip to Nauvoo, so the last two times we've done institute trips to Nauvoo, I've asked Susan to be there, and she's given of us some of her time. And um, Jesse found out she was a massive ping pong whiz. Everybody played her. Nobody beat her. Jesse beat her once. Right, Jesse? Isn't that right? Yep. Only one time. So great. She's really